um, I thought that I would speak a little bit on, for the record, you can continue to meditate if you desire. But, um, and I appreciate always starting these, or often starting sessions with a, a bit of a sit. Um, it just sanctifies the space a lot. Um, I know that they did a, they found that meetings in churches that began with a uh, period of prayer, I believe were far more efficient than ones that didn't. Um, and yet rarely did the organizations feel they had the time to do it, but it actually saved time in the end. And I think there's something very magical about how you can sanctify a space with silence. So, for those who don't know, we have an Upasaka group, um, which is a group of practitioners who hold five precepts and meditate um, daily. Uh, if you are interested in that, you can find the group on our website's front page and the link to it, greenmountainmonastery.org. But the group has been working through a book called uh, Buddha Dhamma by P.A. Piyuto. And as many of you know, Long Parpasano and Ajahn Jaya Saro said that if they were trapped on a desert island with one book, this would be the book. It's a big book. So the part we've been working through is in chapter two, and it deals with the ayatana. So I wanted to just, you know, it's a very dense book. And I find with this sort of reading, if there's not a chance to connect it to one's own life and experience, it really can just feel far too disembodied and it doesn't sink in or strike home. So the second chapter deals with the six sense spheres or ayatana. And that is the um, basically the sense, the conduits of the senses that we receive knowledge through in Buddhist thought. So eyes and uh, physical form, um, and then consciousness and all three make contact. And that's, uh, you know, that's sort of contact at the beginning of experience. Um, and then you have uh, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. And you also have the sixth, which is mano. Um, and that is the intellect, the mind door, the door of the mind, which is the sense door through which we take in uh, all variety of mental impressions, imaginations. It's where most of our uh, experience really originates from in many ways. As many of you know, if you close your eyes and cut off as many external sense doors as you can, that sixth still provides you with plenty. So one interesting thing is there's different words for this these uh, sense uh, doors. The ayatna is one, which basically means the sphere, um, the realm of a certain sense door, the realm of the eye, et cetera. But another term, which is used sometimes is called the indria or the faculties. Um, and these have an active sense and they're often used to speak about the same thing. Um, you know, the eyes, uh, visual forms, that visual, um, experience and so on with the other senses, but it's used when in the context of an active engagement with the world or training in wholesome states. So for example, Indriya Sangwara is the term for restraint of the senses. And the application of that term, and as you know, Indra is a powerful god in the Buddhist cosmos, probably equivalent to Zeus. And the conception that we hidden within this language is that we are very much not passive receivers of our mental and uh, sensory experience, but if we engage with it as a uh, tool over which we have agency, how do we direct the eye? How do we direct the ear? What do we listen to? What do we stare at? Then these become tools on the path. And I appreciate how when these six sense spheres, which sounds very passive, ayatana, are applied in a active way related to the training, they take on this very active 
language, Indria, the faculties. And the next point in this reading, which I found very interesting, is it talks about um, three kinds of knowledge. Um, there's uh, related to three of the aggregates. Um, so as many of you know, the five ag aggregates are the body, um, consciousness, perception, uh, sankara, which is volitional formations programs, basically, we run of personality, of perception, and um, I think I got them all there. Consciousness was the fifth. I think I said that. Uh, but, oh, feeling, I missed, Vedana. But three forms of knowledge exist in Buddhist thought. One is uh, the uh, perception aggregate. And this is uh, how we label things and almost the angle at which we come to them from. So perception, someone can see a similar, uh, you know, sight. And yet if their perception is different than another's, it's a completely different experience. Um, you know, a human being seeing a house cat is very different than a mouse seeing a house cat and the perception and subsequent feelings and papancha that come from that. And perception, that sort of knowledge is divided into immediate um, knowledge, which is just the perception of um, a flower, of the color white, of a taste, um, versus uh, supplementary uh, perceptions, which is what we lay on top of those things. And those may either be uh, influenced by defilement. So say giving attention to the, say there's someone we really are angry at, really giving attention to their negative qualities, feeding that self-righteous fire versus um, applying perception uh, that secondary layer in a positive way, seeing, you know, perhaps actually turning attention to their good qualities um, and, or to the quality of impermanence. Uh, basically any of these Dharma frameworks we lay over perception and experience. This is a way of using that second, secondary um, level of perception of knowledge. The next type of knowledge is consciousness. And that's sort of all-encompassing. Um, it's how we know everything, including mental activity. We're conscious of it. And the third kind of knowledge is in the realm of sankara, volitional formations. And if you don't totally read into what that is, that is completely very usual. It's an extremely complicated uh, term. But in this context, the most uh, important form of knowledge that's hidden within that aggregate of volitional formation is wisdom itself. And uh, basically the development of that faculty. So what I found especially interesting in this reading was the fact that there are three roots uh, to gaining knowledge um, spoken about. And the First is through, um, second, I had this, uh, perception and how we uh, develop that in line with proper understanding. The next is views, which are basically the perceptions we take on from others and identify as our own, as me, as mine slightly, and almost put them on like a suit of clothes until um, they uh, perhaps mold us. And the third sort of route to wisdom, um, to knowledge uh, is um, jnana, which is direct knowing. So these three work in a sort of uh, stairway. So 
we have a perception and it gives rise to a form of knowledge. Um, and over time, it feeds into a view that crystallizes. You know, we have, we meet someone who we dislike a little bit at first, and then every time we meet them, perhaps that perception arises again, and that view of them as someone who's antagonistic to us crystallizes. And um, if it's a wholesome uh, view, say, we hear the Buddhist teachings on impermanence, and um, over time, we begin to really understand that at a deeper level, it sinks in, and that leads to jnana, which is direct knowing. It's when the view can be dropped and we just see things as they are in a neutral way. There's none of that stickiness and ownership. So what's meaningful here is there's a feedback loop where perception is the most base level. After that, you have views and after that, clear knowing. But views and clear knowing, ditti and jnana, have a feedback loop where they feedback into perception. So if we have a view of someone as um, amenable to us, then that affects our perception of them over time. And we uh, will routinely, you know, see, basically see them with rose colored glasses. And this feedback loop, I think is very significant and very dangerous. Because hopefully, if we've practiced, we come to some element of direct vision of reality, and that really affects our perceptions of things. Um, you know, I speak often about going to the hospital in Thailand and seeing the hallways just sort of, Thailand actually has very good hospitals, but this one was overcrowded in, in Isan. And um, just the, sick beds, one after the other, after the other, and the smell of bodily fluids, the moans of those going through pain. One woman was just sort of uh, really, really brutally screaming um, or moaning very loudly, wailing. And you could tell there was this gigantic betrayal of the body, you know, in Buddhism, when we look at the body as just a body, just so much, um, you know, skin, blood, hair, um, sort of this uh, composition of, of elements, um, it can seem a little off-putting, but as with all elements of Buddhist practice, it lets us step back just a little bit. You know, Ajahn Suchi just says, mindfulness is hovering one inch off the ground. And then when, that moment comes where the body does sicken, where pain does come. We're not, we don't perceive it as our own selves being ripped away and broken in the same way. It might still be brutal, but there's not that same sense of utter despair. So this is, an indi this is a place where view, as in the right view of the body as not self, affects perception. Because when push comes to shove and the body does sicken, our hearts aren't tied to it in quite the same way. And we don't perceive what we're losing as, as essential to us in the same way. And that's an enormous boon. Um, we have immense resources as practitioners that we take for granted because it's what we know now, but we've forgotten what it's like to be without that slight distance to really believe that this is all, um, you know, that when the body ages, that's us, us going and um, to have no other refuge and how brutal. That view, you know, not only affects perception of the body, but it also leads to that clear vision of the body as not self. Um, what gets dangerous is when a view gives rise to new perceptions, because this is the deadly feedback loop that traps us. We become stuck on our views and um, they affect the world we see completely. And I think I see this very powerful in politics right now. People 
are um, you know, distressed by states of affairs as they have always been. But there are certainly brutal events now as there have always been, but, but particularly brutal in, you know, in many ways at the moment. Um, but uh, the, the othering that occurs, the fact that once we have a view that we're identified with, how it affects our perception of every issue, every headline. And it can be tricky because a lot of those perceptions seem quite wholesome. You know, maybe we feel a lot of sympathy for this or that. But there's a stickiness there and a danger because often those perceptions that rise out of a really strong view have a shadow. And I think it's worth noting that if in those political conversations that so often come up, you find yourself um, or others, just notice how often a expression of sympathy will be followed almost immediately and inevitably by an immediate othering and anger. And it's not to say we don't, you know, um, see the situation for what it is in its difficulty. It's not like we can't hold certain parties accountable or express uh, a desire to act. But all that can be done with love. And, you know, there was a uh, BBC special um, about the seven deadly sins where they interviewed different religious leaders on them. And the only one out of all this sort of religious leaders that said there was never a place for anger was the Dalai Lama. And this is the Buddhist standard. This is the Buddhist paradigm is there's never, ever a justification for anger. Action is always more powerful when undertaken out of love. And it's really worth using the first noble truth in an active external sense to undermine those views, to find your way past that sticky duality that so often rises, even under the guise of sympathy, but which really has an element of hatred and othering and aversion hidden. Trace the dukkha. So, you know, if you, you know, whatever the other political party is, whatever the other person is, can you trace back their suffering, their brokenness, what they're moving from, what the huge lack is in their lives or experience that's giving rise to this, um, whatever they're doing. Um, and I really try to avoid mentioning any names, but um, I, I think some people have uh, some aversion towards Trump. Um, and I think, you know, just remembering, for example, there, the fact that um, I believe his brother committed suicide when he was young and just give attention to what is worthy because this is how we use perception to cultivate wisdom. This is how the ayatana, the spheres of sensory experience of the world become no longer passive realms. We wander aimlessly in, and rather active indria active faculties um, by which we shape ourselves, our perceptions, and our hearts. So, yeah, it's plenty, I think. Basically just that. This mechanism of perception crystallizing into a view which if correct, leads to jnana, clear vision, both of which give rise to different, more refined and correct perceptions. Or if incorrect, that view gives rise to warped perceptions. And just being very careful of that feeling of a view, of its stickiness, its crystallization. Ajahn, Kovilo and I just spoke with Ajahn Jayasara a few days ago, and he mentioned how he just continuously, uh, whenever he finds himself kind of caught in a rut on a certain view on something, 
he has been just having to ask himself quite frequently, what do I know? And I know I spoke with someone a few weeks ago who he has a rule where if he finds himself saying something vehemently into to himself three times, he knows it's probably wrong in some way, you know, in some sense, it's not right. So if you find yourself repeating that argument, you know, can you be like, maybe not, you know, because just giving yourself that 1% that maybe not, that's that one inch off the ground. May nay, in the words of Ajahn Chah, I'm not sure. So this is how you take that tiering system of perception, view, clear knowing, and you, you use these bottom two of perception and view. Um, you hamstring them basically a bit, or rather you bring in a very wholesome perception of not sure. I'm not sure about my own views. And um, this helps prevent that brutal feedback loop forming, which traps us into suffering, aversion, and all those qualities, which as practitioners, we have no right to indulge in. So I wish you all the best. We have a chance now for Q&A. Um, if people would like to type in anything they'd like to discuss or questions they have on this topic or any other, then we can talk. Good to see so many. Good to see you, Angela, in Vancouver. Great. <laughs> You know, and just to put it out there, um, while people are typing or not typing questions, um, I've just found that the danger of that view crystallizing. And, you know, I was at a ferry terminal um, on my way back to, to Seattle last week at like 1030 at night, because um, my plane got back really late. And there was a um, man sitting there with a soft drink and kind of closed his eyes and just sat in silence. And he looked a bit downtrodden, um, a little scruffy. And as we walked out, we started talking and he was a recovering alcoholic and had just taken a huge step away from everything in his life to get away from this, to find a new, new beginning just a few months before. And I've rarely seen such sincerity in someone so visible. And just to see how, you know, that initial perception of someone from afar is, is so often wrong, so often true knowledge and Dhamma and the hidden gems of our lives just hide right underneath that crust of view and really being willing to listen carefully to the world and note if there's ever that glancing over that stickiness of a view of this person is just, you know, some some guy uh, who it wouldn't be worth talking to or something. The treasures are almost always hidden in those places. Mark. How does one go about dismantling a view that we know on some level to be wrong? Evolutionary biology um, states generally that a we know what our beliefs are, are mainly by our actions. We act our, out our beliefs. So even if we might not say um, this uh, you know, relationship will lead to my happiness, um, the Darwinian perspective would say, if you're acting as if it will, um, then that is a belief of you you have. And I think there's truth to that, but 
what you're saying is also correct that, you know, sometimes views are things we do take on, we know are right, but they conflict with how we're acting. And, or um, we can't quite convince ourselves of them completely. And there's this uh, disjunct between sort of high level pattern patterning in ourselves and our day-to-day -day actions between what we begin to know to be true and what we think of underneath. And this is just where it's really useful to remember how long we've been holding these warped perceptions. By Buddhist conception, it's been lifetimes. And even though you come across the Dhamma and you know, in many cases, it's truth, you feel the profundity, there's a sense of recognition. Um, there's also a lot of sankharas, levels of programs that you have to work through before that can become real embodied knowledge. And this is why it's so important to um, work at yourself as if you're polishing something. You know, um, people often have this idea that if they have an insight, it's with them because it feels that way. You have a sort of blaze of insight and you'll think it'll be with you. But, um, you know, uh, many monastics, including myself, whenever you have an insight, I'll write it down. Or when someone gives me a piece of knowledge um, or wisdom, I'll write it down and I'll review it daily as part of a sort of memorization routine. Um, and this goes for the suttas as well. This sort of thing takes a long time to work on you and you want to bring these recollections up again and again and again, uh, which is why we chant every day, which is why we read the suttas every day, which is why we listen to Dhamma talks. In some ways, the Dhamma, it's, it's just, you know, it, it's not terribly complicated and yet we need to um, bring those, we need to mold ourselves with those beliefs over time and often old views just take a while to dissipate. The Buddha compared it to um, a, uh, uh, one does not create any new kama and one dispels old kama by encountering it again and again. The wearing away is directly visible, immediate. So part of it's just acknowledging that these old rhythms, these old views keep coming and just to let them, just acknowledge them as their patterns. They'll come through and let them fade. Um, mindfulness of the body is also a very powerful way to step out of views, um, to ground yourself. The Buddha says that one who cultivates mindfulness of the body, um, Mara approaching him is like someone throwing a ball, a spool of thread of yarn at a door, a wooden door, and it just hits the door and falls off. Whereas one who doesn't cultivate mindfulness of the body is like a, a pile of wet clay with a and Mara can kind of destroy it like a metal ball thrown into it. And the image I love in that first one is the spool of yarn. Um, it's, it's old comma, you know, and it just unwinds. It hits the door and it unwinds. So really grounding yourself in the body. If you get angry and that old Sankara comes up, come to your elbows, come to your feet. Your elbows aren't usually angry. And that just lets it fade over time. Um, and then I'd say just reframing. Um, often there's, you know, when you ordain as a monastic, you have to sort of step away from a lot of old relationships. But the language around cutting things off brutally never worked for me. And initially I thought that was just wrong view on my part. Like I just wasn't strong enough. But over time I realized like something in me realized performing triage on all these loved relationships wasn't the correct route for me. And rather finding a way to honor the love in those relationships without entangling myself, that was the correct route. So neither view was, was right. The one of maintaining totally entangled with my relationships or cutting them off and just stopping calling. So what I ended up doing was, um, you know, I'd write poems for people, um, gifts once a month and one of those poems as a gift, um, it meant a lot. And it was a way of keeping my heart and letting people know I cared about them. But as a middle path, so sometimes an old view you know isn't right, 
the reason you can't let go is because something in it is right. And you don't have the right to totally discard it. Um, if there's something really resonant in it, you might have to find a way of using it or approaching that view that is, that is actually wholesome and domic. Could you speak a bit about the idea of the chitta often mentioned in the forced tradition? It, of course, is something unorthodox and controversial, trying to grasp it still. Yes, it is indeed uh, controversial in some ways. It's true. Some ways. So I've heard... Longpur Suchitta speaks about the chitta um, better than anyone I've ever known. And he often, you know, in the Pali Suttas, I think often it's used to uh, speak about, it's used in different ways. But Longpur Sumedho often draws a distinction between manas, uh, which is manas, uh, the intellect, which uh, he compares to sort of fingers that grasp objects of attention. It's perception. Um, it's how our faculties go out and grab something and bring it in, analyze it. Chitta is the palm. It's what we press those objects into with manas, what tastes it. It's the subjective sense. And because it's what knows, it's almost impossible to talk about in that way, um, in, in a normal way. It's the subjective sense itself. He also says that um, chitta is to be listened to, but not to be trusted necessarily. And you can teach it. It can be colored by things. And um, he also says that people don't become enlightened, chittas become enlightened. He also says, I just, I love Longpur Suchitto on the chitta, so many good lines. Um, a few years after becoming a monk, he no longer felt the passage of time in the same way. What he felt was the variegations, the changes in the quality of the chitta. I know exactly what he means in that way. The days blur, but the chitta is, is that subjective sense of brightening. So I think the closer you get to the source, the more difficult it is to use language. And there's a tendency to attach to these things as self or to think you can actually grab it as a concept. And that's not correct. And modern Western teachers and Thai teachers, such as uh, Ajahn Mun, still did point as much as they were able a little bit to what remains when you let go of the aggregates. It's not, you know, as dry materialist Westerners, we think of letting go and we're just left with this intuition of a void. But what the Buddha taught with emptiness was, was empty of self, but filled with reality, filled with, you know, I guess, Nibbana. <laughs> and um, I've heard Long Pursu Chitta use Chitta with almost a capital C, almost to indicate something like that. But honestly, I can't wander too far into this realm because it gets dangerous and people start to reify and attach to these things and conceptualize them. So all to say, this is all the finger pointing at the moon. It's not the moon. Um, and it's good to know that there's, you know, it's good to direct your gaze with that finger pointing. Because often as Westerners, we let go, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't use the word Westerners, moderns. Uh, culture now is just across the board, um, so similar in many ways. Um, in this respect, as moderns, um, you know, we uh, let go of what we see and, and we just don't know if there's anything else. And uh, that affects practice pretty brutally. So just gaining a sense for that subjective sense of, of something. And it's, I think it's also, I've heard it spoken about a little bit, like the chitta is also something of what related to that piece of you that intuitively knows what to do. Longpore Sumedho speaks of intuitive awareness. 
but this is all dangerous to talk about because it's um, you know beyond my direct realm of experience. And uh, just to say the Buddha's way was safe in saying, let go of all the things you're not and you'll come to what's left and that's good and that's Nibbana, the cessation of greed, hatred and delusion. I think we have time for one more. Could you offer some advice on practicing the eight monastic precepts for an extended period? I've been thinking about taking the eight for at least the first week of Vasa. I think you're speaking about the eight um, Uposita precepts. That's great. Uh, you should go for it if you can. I don't have time to talk about much of it now because we just hit 645. Um, but I'd say, uh, you know, um, in terms of not eating afternoon, which is one of them, um, know that you can take a bit of sugar, um, dark chocolate, kombucha in the afternoon, in the evening. Um, it should help. Um, it'll, it, you will get used to it over time. It takes a little bit. Um, and giving up entertainment can be difficult. Um, so sometimes it's good to have a little bit of wholesome entertainment um, in the sense of like, there's some documentaries on Dhamma, one called Amongst White Clouds on YouTube for free. It's this man going around interviewing all these amazing hermits in the Chinese mountains. They're, they're so, it's a beautiful documentary, Amongst White Clouds. So find some health food to replace the junk food you're giving up. And I'd say that documentary would, it's, it's Dhamma. All right, I think we're out of time. I hope everyone's well. If those who want to uh, are free to join on Zoom from 6.45 to 7.30, I'm posting the link. And um, yeah, uh, for those who can't see the link or click on it, just um, go to our webpage and you'll find it halfway down there. We'll all see you soon. Okay. Can you hear me, Juanita? <laughs>